Welcome to Summer Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Ralph Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. We are exploring the texts assigned for the second Sunday of Easter on April 19th, 2020. They are Acts 2.14a and 22 through 32, but you're going to read through verse 36, as you'll understand soon. Psalm 16. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9, starting a run through 1 Peter this Easter, and then the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And I love the story of Doubting Thomas, Caroline. This just story makes a love of his doubt. Doubting his Thomas. His doubt yeah. that makes Doubting. You, Thomas Doubting. the doubter. Doubt. Yep. doubt. Well, uh, yeah, I. that's one thing that our uh, illustrious fellow podcaster, uh, brings out in her commentary on the website on this passage about that has really nothing to do with doubt and everything to do with wanting. In fact, the word doubt is not there, uh, but everything to do with uh, that Mary said, I have seen the Lord. Mary Magdalene says, I have seen the Lord. The disciples say, I have seen the Lord. And that's just simply what Thomas wants. Uh, but thank you very I, much, Caroline. What's that? Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a great commentary, Joy. Thank it you. It is. It really is. And but uh, I, and we can go there. Where I again, you know, we we've been in our podcasting lately with uh, with our global pandemic. Where I went immediately uh, in this passage is peace be with you. And and it's a it's a it's a remarkable uh, moment here in John because the last uh, two places, the only other place in, in the Gospel of John that we've heard peace be with you is the farewell discourse. Uh, in 1427, where Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Uh, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. And then the next time that we hear these same kinds of words is in 1633. I have said this to you so that, that in me you may have peace. And so the last time that the disciples have heard Jesus saying these kinds of words is in the farewell discourse, which is Jesus at his pastoral best of, of saying that I'm leaving, I, uh, and, but but uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. I'm preparing a place for you and peace is in me. And then here they are, you know, huddled in this locked room and Jesus enters in and says, peace. And so I just have this sense of the disciples being there and that the, this entirety of the farewell discourse and those words of comfort and hope and oneness and you are my own and peace and the gift of the paraclete are just like flooding back into their hearts and and it's like so it's not just it's not just peace but it's it's the presence of jesus peace that he has promised uh, is what they get to hear in this moment. I think it's just extraordinary. That is, uh, that is extraordinary. And it, it, it reminds me um, to think about peace at this moment is uh, uh, we, we, we did a special podcast on preaching in the time of pandemic. And I mentioned Luther's um, uh, 1527 uh, treatise on whether one may flee the plague. And in that he says, he talks about uh, affirming the peace of, of the resurrected Christ. And he says, Christ's peace is not to remove us from disaster and death, but rather to have peace in the midst of disaster and death, because Christ has already overcome these things. So the peace that we are extended in the midst of these times is not necessarily um, deliverance from it, but peace within it, because Christ has overcome it. Yeah, and so I just, I think, thank you for that, Rolf. I think um, that, yeah, that hearing those words, peace, uh, if, if a sermon could somehow replicate that, if a sermon could go back and even use the words, I mean, what is it that they fear? Uh, yes, of course, they, they fear that Jesus' fate might be their own, but they, fund, they ultimately fear, are Jesus' words going to come true? Uh, everything that he said, and, and that night, <laughs> are, is that really going to happen? And 
So if the preacher can bring those words of, of their words, you know, of Thomas, I mean, this is the last time we heard from Thomas was in the farewell discourse, right? Thomas saying, we don't know the way. We don't know the way. Where are you going? We don't know. And Jesus saying, I am, in the, I am the way. And so, and so giving, giving voice to those words of, of, of fear uh, and uh, that, that we get in the farewell discourse and, that, and then into that, Jesus says peace. I think that, that way a sermon doesn't just say peace, but creates that experience of, of the layers of fear and that uh, Jesus enters into that space uh, with, a, with the peace of his own presence. That's what I would do with a sermon this week. And in that moment, Thomas also says, let's go, you know, let's go with him. So Thomas is re willing to go, which brings that full circle. It's like, oh, wow, you know, you guys have had that. I was, I was willing to go back then. And uh, I just want to be willing again. Um, I, I just, uh, I really think we can capture that, Caroline, and to make use the words that are familiar around the discussions that we are having um, to name what our fears are, to name what our disruptions are, to name where um, we wish we could see what others bear testimony to. I think the preacher can do that by listening to the congregation um, and, then, and then speaking. Um, and, and in some ways, if I dare to move to Acts on this, that's what Peter is doing. He's pulling back the familiar words to bring it to bear of the experience that they have just encountered. Well, yeah, that Acts sermon is, it's, it's a tough sermon to follow because it's his form of argument isn't necessarily ours. Uh, but you're absolutely right, Joy. It's this idea of pulling from the back, pulling from scripture, pulling from tradition, pulling from confidence that's kind of on loan to us or has been bequeathed to us from from people before us. But it's also deeply rooted in Peter's own personal experience, right? Or the community of faith's own personal experience. I can say no or nobody's right. Oh, Joy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was gonna I was trying to say exactly. That is exactly what's happening. And and that becomes the way that a preacher can speak that alive to the congregation um, by by using the the familiarity of when we you know if we're not gathering now when we were gathering you know and and then to make that this is the comfort that we have here because god is still with us what's a challenge about that passage i think in our in the well probably all the time but more so when things aren't going smoothly in life is the passage is less about look, Jesus rose from the dead, and the passage is more about, remember the, the context of this is Pentecost. The, uh, the, um, the point of the sermon is Christ is now enthroned, right? Or Christ has been exalted and is now Lord over all creation. Death and resurrection were parts of what it took for God to make that happen in ways that Acts doesn't really explain in terms of, you know, no no, uh, no diagrams or anything like that, right? Or real explanations or recipes. But it's this idea that the proclamation, which is an Easter proclamation, of course, is Jesus of Nazareth is now Lord over all creation. That's one reason why you have to go through verse 36. Um, there are others, but that's where finally Peter delivers the main point of the sermon. So why, why cut that out? The problem, of course, is what does it mean for to declare Jesus as Lord over all creation when things aren't going? great for all of us. And you could say that all the New Testament and all of Christian faith is, is always engaged in trying to reconcile that. What does it mean to call Jesus Lord while at the same time walking through a life full of, of sorrow and pain and, and disappointment? So I don't think you run from that on Easter. I think that's where you go on Easter and say, look, this, this, this Christ is risen. He's risen indeed is not nostalgia for a day where people got cheered up. It's a way of living into a future that's fraught with peril with a kind of confidence um, in a God whose ways are not typically seen because <laughs> um, we haven't been trained to see them. 
Yeah, the, uh, I like that. Um, I, I deeply appreciate it. Uh, so that, you know, because Easter is a season, not just one Sunday, and here we are in the second Sunday, um, to, pick, to pick up that theme, which is uh, uh, the theme that God's presence is made manifest in suffering. Um, uh, a big part of the theology of the cross for me is the promise that uh, the place where God has promised to show up and be present is exactly where God least seems evident in the cross. And therefore, in our own experiences of suffering, grief, death, um, loneliness, depression, all of those things, that is where God continually has shown up. And maybe this is the time to look back over the last weeks uh, where we've had the uh, experiences of pandemic and isolation. And uh, what is it, Caroline, you said a few weeks ago, uh, or maybe it was you, Joy, Barbara Brown Taylor, uh, talks about uh, learning to be a detective of God's presence. And where do you look for that? You look for that. Uh, in those moments of maybe you've had a death in your community uh, and or experience of of grave illness that someone's had and and uh, offer that bring those folks testimony of God's presence um, bring that back in now yeah and uh, and with that uh, just to go back to the the John story for a minute another verse that I think that could be uh, meaningful for people right now. Again, we're recording this and we don't really know where we're going to be at this point, uh, if we'll still be uh, in, you know, shelter and home situations. But, uh, but, but regardless, I go to verse 31. I, well, 30 and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, but these are written so that you might come to believe. And that's one translation Another translation, uh, it depends on a textual variant, which, you know, uh, if anybody wants to Zoom me and talk about textual variants, that would be really fun. But, Only uh, if we can talk about concessive uh, uh, participles, too. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but the, the textual variant uh, also uh, supports a reading that would be, but these are written so that you may continue to believe. Uh, and... And so it, it's a promise that these words that we hear in scripture uh, are, were never about, you know, information about Jesus, but are, uh, are there to support and nurture our believing, uh, our faith. And in, you know, as I've said 127 million times, uh, you know, believing in the gospel of John is not a, a noun, but a verb and uh, signals relationship. And so uh, that would be another place that, you know, we read these words uh, every year. Uh, we read these, we read our scriptures um, and maybe, you know, maybe without each other around, but in that the promise is, is that our, our believing that relationship with Jesus will be nurtured, will be sustained, uh, that that's actually the purpose. <laughs> That's the purpose, that's the function that John sees in, in hearing these words once again. And that's the promise uh, that, 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 our, that that nurturing will, will indeed occur. You will be sustained in your believing. And if I can turn to Psalm 16, that prayer becomes real then, because where we are right now is claiming a faith in the midst of disruption. And right now, I need to be able to have hope in order to pray this psalm, protect me, O oh God, for in you I take refuge. And I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. And, and for us to realize that that is our hope, that, that in the midst of every security that we thought we had, our relationships, our contacts, our our practices that are, are, um, are, are, have become rituals, um, the things that we're familiar with, all of that has been disrupted. And now we have to say, as those who have gone on before, this is not just words I repeat, but this is my faith. I trust in you, God. You are my refuge. I think the psalm gives us enough to know something about who the psalmist was. Um, and that is uh, a Levite who has no property, no inheritance. And so, so this language about um, 
God being the chosen portion and the lot and the boundary lines um, and the heritage, um, it might, the Levite has no uh, land, has no inheritance. God himself is the inheritance, but the psalmist is able to say your boundary lines, the boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places for me. Um, there are undoubtedly people who have lost businesses in the last weeks. And there's undoubtedly preachers who uh, probably churches are on the borderline financially. And so with members losing businesses and jobs, um, uh, the fear that churches will close or pastors will lose jobs. I mean, this is, this is a Psalm to be equipped to turn to ourselves when this happens to us and uh, perhaps to offer pastoral care to those. I was talking to a buddy, um, of mine who owns who owns a bar and in Minnesota uh, the governor shut down all the bars and I contacted him I said are you going to make it and he said uh, no probably not probably not going to be able to make it out of this and so him just imagining his business gone and all his employees then uh, that are full-time unemployed and that's the reality of this and to think about God as as our inheritance and our refuge it's a pretty um, profound uh, statement Thanks for that. It's important stuff about how the psalm here sounds differently today. I, I want to say something about First Peter, since we're starting seven weeks on First Peter, and there's a way in which this passage sounds different today, uh, chapter 1, 3 through 9. This is a book that is written, it appears to a community that's really suffering. And I think it's really important to note that the, the kind of suffering they appear to be experiencing is persecution on behalf of their faith. This is not a kind of generalized suffering. It's either some kind of social ostracism. Of, um, we don't know if it's downright violence or not. But when it says something about how you've had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith might be found to result in praise and glory and honor, we just need to be careful how that's heard, I think. And so if you're reading this text that you might want to make reference in some way to this, that the, the context here is is not God sending illness to see if you can handle it or see if your faith can persevere. Um, this is the way in which I think the author of First Peter, probably writing to a community that's on the verge of getting wiped out, um, is trying to find some way of building faith in the midst of, of, of great loss. Um, Shively Smith has got a great book on First Peter that's helped me see it that way, but just a, a way of, of viewing that. On the other side, First Peter is just some beautiful language to keep coming back to throughout Easter. Some beautiful claims here in, in chapter one that are definitely worth uh, spending time with. This idea of a new birth into a living hope uh, and what that looks like as well. And how uh, the church can lead the way forward through a lot of that as we do move into a time of hope.